Okay, Chris, and everybody else is seeing it all right? Yep, okay, good. So we'll get underway with the presentation. Uh, thank you all for attending and participating in this matter. It's a very important one for your community. And uh, we're here to try and work together to uh, come to a solution um, as is this required uh, of Saltaire. So first thing is the BC surface water treatment standards, um, which were introduced in 2012 and are required of all surface water systems, water systems in British Columbia. Um, we call it the one of the little quick terms we use is the 43210 standards. And the reason for that is that uh, uh, there's particular um, you know, uh, uh, levels of achievement uh, of treatment that are required um, for that. So, and it go, follows under the 43210. So the first thing, and this is a little bit technical, but just to give you a picture, is a four log removal of viruses. So four log is 99.99% removal. Um, the two is a, th a three log removal of parasites. Parasites uh, like Giardia and Cryptosporidium um, are disease causing from uh, surface waters. And they're common for people that are in the backcountry, for example, and drink surface water without treatment. So that's a three log removal, a 99.9% uh, removal of those. Uh, the third standard is two treatment processes, uh, disinfection processes. Um, so for example, the commonly used ones are ultraviolet radiation and chlorination. And that's what we have in Saltaire already. And we've had surface for a number of years. Uh, the fourth standard is uh, less than or equal to one NTU of turbidity. NTU is a measure of turbidity or cloudiness of the water. And so that has to be, um, if, if you have turbidity in the water, then that has to be reduced to one NTU or less. We actually um, are very fortunate in that our water source from Stocking Lake is almost 100% of the time below one NTU naturally. Uh, so we have an excellent water source, but we still have to meet these standards. And then finally, the zero is uh, detectable E. coli, fecal coliform, and or total coliform in the treated water. Those are all bacteria that are naturally occurring um, in the uh, gut of warm-blooded creatures and uh, are an indicator that if they're present, um, you may see pathogenic or disease-causing bacteria present as well. So we are required to treat that to such a degree that zero are detectable uh, through the water system. So again, as we've been saying quite a bit, the, uh, this is a re uh, mandatory um, standard. All water systems in BC that use surface water as a, as a water source uh, must meet the standard. And uh, that's been in place uh, since 2012. Uh, there's been a, a you know, period of time in which the various water systems have been implementing this. And uh, in Saltaire, we are overdue to, uh, to meet the standard. Um, and everywhere, uh, certainly Saltaire included, it's very expensive. It's a, you know, there's a, a large capital and operating investment required of all surface water providers. We have a couple examples here. Comox Valley Regional District, $126 million. Uh, North Salt Spring Island Waterworks District, that's an improvement district, $8.4 million. And uh, Lady Smith just next door at $14 million. And so you can see that there's uh, large investments needed of all communities to meet the standard. In addition to the uh, 43210 standards, there's also um, what are called uh, disinfection byproduct standards. So uh, almost all water systems use chlorine as part of their disinfection system. The reason for that is that chlorine uh, has, it, you know, creates what's called a residual in the water system. That means there's still a, a small trace amount present uh, in all the pipes and that prevents bacteria or viruses from growing uh, back again and keeps the water system clean. However, if you have organic matter in your water, and again, normally um, all surface waters will have some degree of organic matter just naturally occurring from the vegetation uh, surrounding the, the water source. Uh, when that reacts with the chlorine, you get a disinfection byproducts, um, which are considered probably carcinogenic under the Canadian Drinking Water Quality Guidelines. So that's another thing that we have to think about in, uh, in terms of providing treatment. Uh, the two are, and these are big long words, but trihalomethanes, THMs, and Paleoacetic acids um, are the two particular ones that are uh, that have standards we have to meet. Um, currently in salt air, the average levels that we've seen are slightly 
they, they, they bounce around a bit, but, uh, but typically they've been a little above the Canadian drinking water quality guidelines. So that's the thing that we, we do also have to uh, consider in our treatment process and a standard that we have to meet. We uh, have been given a contravention order by Island Health, um, and that's uh, uh, a power that Island Health has under Section 26 of the Drinking Water Protection Act, and that uh, gives them the ability to direct and require uh, local governments to do certain things. And in this case, it's, uh, it's to uh, proceed with our uh, treatments uh, upgrade filtration in order to meet the requirements we've just discussed in the previous slides. Uh, one of the other elements that they've had to uh, try and encourage us to, to uh, carry this out is that we're no longer able to get construction permits um, for system upgrades and maintenance. So for example, in Saltaire, we've been working some years on uh, pipe replacement, on upgrading the distribution piping, which has been uh, in the past failing uh, because of age and, and deterioration. And so for a number of years now, we've been, several years, we've been unable to uh, carry out that work um, because they're saying, well, not until you, you meet um, the uh, drinking water standards. So that's, uh, that's providing some encouragement as well. Not that we need more, but uh, that's, that's uh, another um, uh, effect of this requirement. So what have we been up to in that time? Well, it's, uh, we've been working hard to try and look at alternatives and um, come up with the best uh, approach for your community. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, this is, it's expensive. It's a, it's a lot of money for a community to put forward. And uh, even the larger ones, uh, you know, are, are having to spend a lot of money on it. Um, unfortunately for, you know, as we get smaller in scale, to meet the standard uh, usually costs more per customer, uh, per connected customer to the system. And the smaller you get, the, the higher that cost is in general. And so for uh, Saltera, a, it's a very serious matter and, and it's a lot of money to consider. So we did uh, have been looking for groundwater. Groundwater does not have to meet uh, the drinking water standards or the surface water standards because it, the groundwater typically does not have the same constituents that um, surface water has. So uh, that's uh, one option we've been looking into. We've been uh, vigorously uh, submitting grant applications. Uh, two grant submissions that were already submitted and were unsuccessful with federal and provincial governments. And we have a third in now that uh, we are expecting to hear from the provincial side anytime now. They've said fall 2020. So we're, we're very hopeful that we'll be able to get um, funding. It is one, one uh, incentive for us to, you know, to have waited a while on, uh, on, a, on achieving um, the treatment requirements, just because if we can get a grant, it, it makes a big difference for all of our customers. And uh, so we've been really trying hard to get, get some money in for that. And then the other thing is we um, want to be sure that we end up with a, you know, a successful uh, treatment process. Sometimes water chemistry can be complex and and uh, and unexpected things can occur. And so we've been uh, working on some pilot, um, small pilot plants, um, working directly with the water that we actually get from Stocking Lake, um, uh, as well to make sure to confirm that that what we believe to be the right choice is in fact going to be the right choice. Um, so the upshot of all that is a what we we generally use the term filtration system um, needs to be added to the treatment system, and that will be six, will will be removing bacteria, viruses, parasites, and um, reduce the organics from the source water, so that our disinfection byproducts are reduced uh, to within the standards required. So that's what this boils down to, and we use broadly the term filtration uh, to refer to this whole process and the technology um, that we need to invest in. So one pilot study we did this summer used one technology called ultrafiltration and uh, granular activated carbon together. Um, and we, we ran just one and just the other and then together to see whether we'd be able to reduce our dissolved organics and meet the requirements. Unfortunately, uh, although it does meet the requirement for filtration with respect to bacteria and viruses, um, it doesn't uh, meet it with respect to the removal of the organics. And uh, when I say unfortunately, just that ultrafiltration and, and uh, activated carbon would be uh, cheaper than, than the higher requirements that we'd have to meet. So we looked at that, but that's not going to do it. Um, so we've lined up uh, two pilots uh, that use different arrangements for nanofiltration. Nanofiltration is a very 
very, very sophisticated membrane type of treatment. And uh, we're very confident that will meet the requirements uh, being a step up from ultrafiltration. But, um, but still, we're going to run these two pilots and different arrangements um, for those pilots to, to confirm that it actually works and doesn't have other problems like, for example, blinding of the membranes or anything else that could, could occur based on our actual water source from Stocking Lake. So why did we come to nanofiltration? Well, uh, there's a few um, reasons why we think it's a, the best way to go. Um, it definitely, you know, we're very, very confident, the pilots will confirm that, but we're very confident it'll be effective at removing all the bacteriological elements, the viruses, bacteria, and, um, and, and other elements, um, and also reduce the organics in the water as well. Uh, and that will be confirmed uh, in our pilots, but we, we're very confident it will be successful. Um, with the very fine pores that we uh, have and a, a pretreatment step, we can do this without adding extra chemicals. Uh, some of the treatment processes require chemicals to be added to the water in order to remove various constituents. There's no, none of that required for nanofiltration, which is good, uh, we think, um, as far as our customers are concerned, the water they're drinking, but also allows us, uh, when you have any kind of filtration, there's a certain percentage of the water has to be bypassed and returned to the environment in one way or another. In some technologies, you have to store it up in a big, large tank and then haul it away. Um, and that's if you've got chemicals in the, in the treatment process, so you've got to haul it away for disposal elsewhere. Um, in this case, uh, we think we can we can just let it run over the ground like uh, rainwater does um, without any impacts, and uh, that's much less cost uh, as far as operations. And also, um, you know, we have uh, 19 other water systems the CVRD operates throughout the regional district, 16 other sewer systems, and so we're we're very busy. We've got a lot of a lot of issues to attend to. And our operators are constantly on the move throughout the regional district, attending to various matters that they have to do on a daily basis or respond to um, emergencies and that kind of thing. So nanofiltration also provides for a lower operational requirement. So they, they won't have to have our operators attending as frequently um, as some of the other technological choices. And so for us, that's, a, that's important and a good choice and results in lower costs for you, the, the customer. So, um, as I mentioned at the outset, to give you some warning, the uh, capital costs are large uh, for this uh, for this uh, system. Um, we're expecting about three million dollars for uh, the capital cost, to which we've added a contingency of seven hundred thousand um, dollars. We the uh, three million dollar figure came from some estimates provided by technology suppliers um, that uh, gave us some quotes for for treatment. And so that's a basis for it, but we've got some contingency there to provide some room because often unexpected things come up. So that uh, total capital cost that we would be uh, looking for approval for, for borrowing, would be $3.7 million. Um, at current rates, the estimated cost per customer, when I say customer, I mean a, 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 a private home, um, would be $270 a year. In addition to that, there's annual operations and maintenance cost, and for membrane type treatment, type treatment place, uh, systems, you also have to allow for replacement of the membranes. They only last a certain number of time, and so that has to be uh, included in our operations maintenance costs. And we're, we uh, have a what we think is a quite conservative estimate of $150,000 a year. Um, we've given you that figure. We believe we can do it for less than that, but we want to be careful as to what expectations uh, we we provide, um, so that would work out to about a uh, about a cost of $170 per year per customer. One of the other advantages in our situation at Saltair and our just and our supply from Stocking Lake is it comes down. Stocking Lake is uh, perched way up on the hillside, and uh, we have a water main that runs all the way downhill to our main pressure reducing station where the treatment this treatment will be located, and so it naturally has a lot of pressure available to it. And that's an advantage because you need some pressure to, to run it through nan nano filtration membranes and we, we have it naturally, so we don't have to provide more pumping. And so that helps as well. So between the capital cost working out to about $270 a year and operations and maintenance costs of about $170 a year, we are saying that uh, to expect a total additional charges of about $440 per year. And that's a little over a 50% increase as compared to your current costs. 
So as I mentioned, we are uh, hopeful that we'll be able to get a grant and that's going to help uh, substantially with our capital. Um, so we've, we've uh, the application has been into the one of the latest programs, the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program, a federal and provincial program. If that grant is successful, the funding will pay for 73% of the capital costs. So that will help a lot. And then only 26, uh, a little over 26% will come from the Salter um, customers. Uh, so we're very hopeful that we're, we'll be successful in that application. Um, however, if the if it's not successful, then the capital costs will have to come uh, from the customers, and that we will be seeking long-term borrowing approval for that. Oh, and I should note as well that um, the operations maintenance costs will be are not are not subsidized by a grant, so those costs will be fixed even if we do get the grant. The grant is only for the capital part um, of the expense. We, uh, all regional districts need to um, seek approval of the customers within the service area for long-term borrowing. It's required under the legislation. And so that's something that we will be coming to you um, after this initial public consultation process. Uh, it's a decision of the CVRD board how to go about doing that. Um, and this is a, a matter in, uh, again, in the legislation. So we have to, we have to uh, approach it in one way or another. Uh, there's three options under the legislation for the CVRD board to consider. One is a petition process, and that's where there's a form, a petition form, that a majority of the householders have to sign within the service area. Um, another is a referendum, which is a, a vote. Uh, that's the first petition is uh, per household, majority of households, and other. We don't have much other types of um, property owners, but any commercial or institutional would also be part of that. And uh, whereas a referendum is just the voters vote in a referendum, much like a by-election or anything else. And it's basically a yes or no question. And you have to turn up at a, at a uh, polling booth and, 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 and indicate your preference on a ballot. And then the last uh, process is an alternative approval process or called an AEP. And that's one where there's a, a series of ads are put in local papers and also we inform you uh, in other ways that that's coming up. And then if you're opposed to the borrowing going ahead, then um, people have the opportunity to fill out a, a form, um, which they can get here at the office and say that they're opposed to that proceeding. Uh, if more than 10%, again, of the voters, not the property owners, but of the voters fill out the form, then the CVRD can't proceed. Uh, now we, uh, that's a decision of the board um, after this initial uh, consultation process that we have we're doing right now um, so that's a board decision we can't tell you what it what their decision will be however we can say that the staff recommendation in this case will be the alternative approval process um, it's times of covid and um, you know any other process that's more actively involves you know person to person engagement we think is not a great choice at this time um, but also the situation here is not really one that uh, you know we have any option on it's it's required a required standard, required borrowing that we have to do. And so um, we believe that an AAP process would be uh, the simplest um, way to proceed um, to meet that requirement. So a very good question. In fact, I got a call yesterday from uh, one of the customers there and uh, saying, well, what happens if we do not get approval uh, through, we'll say if it's a, an AAP process? Um, well, there's basically two possible outcomes there. Uh, one is that the CVRD board may refer that to a referendum. That's again something legislation allows. Although I would say that if an AAP is not pro has not been successful, it's not likely that a referendum would either. But the board has that uh, ability; they may do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then secondarily, Island Health may issue an order that supersedes customer approval for long-term borrowing. So if they issue an, another order, a follow-up order that says CVRD thou shalt, so to speak, uh, put in the filtration system, then we have to do it. And then, um, and then that supersedes the requirement to get the uh, agreement of the, of the customers of the system. <clears throat> it's a bit of an odd question. Well, you know, why even go through this? Why, why, <laughs> why ask you uh, your approval for something in which they, they could just direct it anyway? Well, we can't really answer that. That's up to Island Health, and we can't say they would issue an order, but that is within their powers to do so. Um, I would imagine that they're they want people to 
have the opportunity to express their opinions on it and hopefully agree that yes, this needs to be done. So that's what the way we're approaching this at this time and informing people of what uh, the, the um, situation is and um, hopefully being able to proceed from there. So we have uh, in the recent order uh, that we got from Island Health, we have a, a timeline, a detailed timeline was included in that order and there's steps along the way. They recognize that, you know, we have to get consent of the community for borrowing. It has to go through a number of steps um, to do that and then needs approval of the um, provincial government in order to proceed. And so they've allowed for that in our, in our uh, process, in our timeline. Also thereafter, we have to get uh, design work done and those kinds of things in order to proceed with construction. So all of that takes a fair bit of time and they have uh, allowed for that in their order uh, but have specifically identified the steps and uh, and we're required to meet those steps uh, according to that timeline. So here are some of the uh, elements of that uh, of that of those steps we have to take uh, starting back in September 2020. Uh, Borrowing Guala went to the board for three readings and has now been submitted to the Inspector of Municipalities. Uh, we are doing our public information consultation period now, and this of course is part of that. Um, then we're assuming that uh, that the AP process will be that approved by the board, in which case we need a period of time for the electors to respond to the AP process, the ads in the paper, and that's 60 days under CVRD policy. Um, and then if that's, uh, if that's successful, then we go to our procurement process. We have to select a technology and a provider of that technology. Uh, then we have to carry on with detailed design work and then get approvals of Island Health and then the actual construction and procurement of this treatment system can proceed after that. In our timeline from Island Health, they've indicated that all work must be done by August 2022. And we believe we can uh, we can meet that timeline successfully. Okay, so uh, Mr. Moderator, that brings us back uh, to the end of my presentation on this. Um, these slides were intended to um, create some interest and some questions this minute, I got to go out of here. And there we go. So um, I, I'll put it on mute now and leave it to you to respond to or to bring uh, direct the questions as they come forward to the uh, best responder. Thanks, Brian. Uh, so we've had a couple of questions come in from uh, Sue Miller who's participating here. The first one goes back to the beginning of the presentation, Brian, I believe when you showed the other regional districts or local governments who are doing um, comparative upgrades. And the question is for comparative costs in other regions that have already updated, what is the per capita cost or per parcel cost of those? I know you had the overall costs shown. Do we have any sense of what those might've been for um, the individual households or taxpayers? Oh, uh, I, I have an answer, but Todd's got even more information. So I'll pass it over to Todd. Hey, Chris. Um, yeah, I saw that, uh, um, that question pop up. So I just uh, did a little bit of math and Comox Valley Regional District has 66,000 people um, and for their cost of their treatment plan it equals about $1,900 per capita. And if you use the 2.9 person per home, uh, if you want a parcel number to that, I guess it's closer to 6,000. Uh, as far as Ladysmith goes, there's 8,500 people there. So it's more like $1,700 uh, per person or uh, $5,500 per home. So those are the numbers that I came up with for that. Okay, thanks, Todd. Uh, the second question that came in also from Sue was, uh, were there not, sorry, I'm just trying to scroll so I can see the whole question here. There we go. Were there not a series of pilot studies started quite a while ago, um, around 2015? And what were the results? Uh, were the results published on our website or how might residents get access to them? And do they include expandability criteria? Uh, 
Uh, I see my staff is, are speaking, but they're they're all muted, so we cannot. Sorry, hear. Uh, we were just conferring on that. Okay. Um, uh, no, we don't. We don't have any other pilots uh, that we can think of. It may be Lady Smith ran a number of pilots um, on their treatment system. Just to be clear, too, you know that you can you can have some very different uh, water chemistry and water quality. Um, so, for example, uh, one of the one of the problems Lady Smith has is that they get a lot of turbidity in their water. Um, as it runs down from Holland Lake, it picks up a lot of turbidity in the long way. So that's silty clay materials that get into the water, make it cloudy. Um, so by the time it gets down to their pickup point at Chicken Ladder, they can uh, often have very high turbidity numbers, well above the drinking water standards. And so their treatment system requires um, is is even more complex than, than what we'd be looking at for sure. And they have to deal with all that turbidity, and that's that's a that's a fairly um, complex and difficult thing to do. Uh, some of the other treatment systems we've seen that CRD are running on uh, Salt Spring Island, uh, for example, also have to deal with some lots of turbidity. We're very, very fortunate in Stocking Lake in that we virtually always below in one NTU. So that helps our situation uh, a lot. But but so, you know, Lady Smith ran a number of pilots um, on their system to, to make sure uh, comfortably that they're going to be able to deal with the turbidity problems that they, they face for their treatment. Okay, well, assuming no other staff want to weigh in on that one, uh, I'll go to another question from Sue. She was quick on the quick on the draw here. That's good. Uh, she she asks did, if she she believes she saw an estimate of almost five million for this membrane filtration back in approximately 2016, um, but she wonders how did it get reduced from that number, if indeed that was the figure that was that was sure. there back then. Todd is enthusiastically leaping in again, so I'll let, I'll let him uh, answer that. So the um, the estimate that you're speaking of was from uh, a design and WSP, a, a firm that we were looking at utilizing. Um, they gave us a few options and that's where that number came from. The new number, uh, which I believe is gonna be the next question, Chris, so I can kind of roll into it. It's, it's from a design build firm, which is why you see the reduction in cost. So, uh, as you alluded to, uh, I guess the follow up question from Sue was, uh, are we reconsidering others who have had this type of system um, for best practices and suppliers to potentially speed up a procurement process for uh, when we go to market with it? The, the approach we have is actually, um, it's a design build approach from uh, standardized uh, purveyors of this sort of equipment, so that's that's as fast as it's going to go. Um, you know, we we uh, it's there. You know, they they provide this sort of stuff in in a variety of locations, and so that's actually a much faster process than hiring a separate design engineering company, a consulting company to come up with a design, and then that all needs approval, and then we go out for procurement for the actual technology. So a design build approach is is you know as fast as we're going to get. Thanks, Brian. Our next question comes from Jason, uh, and he says, he thanks you, Brian, for answering a lot of the questions that he had in the presentation. Uh, he wonders that $700,000 sounds like a lot for a contingency. What would that contingency cover? It's, uh, so the contingency is basically unexpected. So, so we, you know, we um, provided information to, you know, purveyors of, of technology and got these estimates. Uh, we think, you know, we think it's it's going to be uh, pretty accurate, uh, but we, you know, there's all kinds of things that are very hard to predict. Um, I mean, the pandemic, what's that going to do? Uh, in certain areas, supply chains are very different than they were before. And is that going to affect our pricing? We don't know. The Canadian dollar can change. A lot of the technology comes from elsewhere in the world. Uh, that can affect it uh, tremendously. Um, we also want to be really comfortable and make sure that we've got enough room there because it's it's important to know I think for the customers here that the approval doesn't mean we have to spend that money. It just means that we can spend up to that amount on borrowing. So if we're able to, if we're able to get this done for 3 million, then that's all we'll borrow. We won't borrow 3.7 million. Um, and so the only thing we can use that money for is salt filtration at salt air. We can't use it for anything else in the CVRD. Um, so if we can, if we can do that better and save some money, we definitely will. Uh, but we wanted to make sure we have enough room uh, to, that the, the the project's done and complete and meets the standards and requirements and timeline of Island Health. 
Okay, our next question comes from Tammy Edwards, and she asks, are we able to use the money that's set aside for infrastructure upgrades as discussed in previous meetings? That's possible. We've had, because we haven't spent um, the last year or two um, that money, um, that could be utilized. When we had the public meeting last year and we asked uh, the people there at the meeting whether they wanted to make use of, like set aside some of that money and not continue for a period of time or to a lesser degree on the pipe replacement, the uh, response we got was that um, no, people said by a fairly strong margin that they would prefer to spend, keep spending the money on the uh, pipe replacement program per year. So once we've met this, then that money will be available again. It is possible to consider uh, doing that, and that may be, uh, you know, something that uh, the CBRD board may want to uh, pursue. Um, right now, we're keeping, you know, to a, um, you know, a kind of a narrow track on this. We've got the money we've got estimated for the capital cost. We're seeking the boring approval for that. If down the road a bit, you know, other kind of mixes of funding want to be pursued by the board, that's possible. And, um, you know, we'd have to inform them of the, uh, you know, of the poll we took last year um, on that. Uh, but it could be something that would be pursued. So that would reduce the boring for sure. But it also means that we're uh, we're falling further behind on the pipe replacement, which is another major issue that Saltair has and has to deal with. Also, um, I, we mentioned this last year, but I'll mention it again now. Um, the uh, Stocking Lake Dam uh, is old. It was built about 100 years ago, and uh, a lot of the construction of it was logs and and soil, and um, it, it definitely needs replacing as well. And that's another issue, and we've been directed by the province to deal with that as well. That We share that with Ladysmith, though. So that would be a shared cost, but still it's another substantial um, project that will have to be carried out in the foreseeable future. And so there's going to be costs for that. We don't even know yet what kind of costs are involved. Um, and there's geological factors and a number of other things. So, you know, though that's hanging in the in the in the in the wings as well for salt air, unfortunately. Lots of uh, lots of issues to deal with. Thanks, Brian. Uh, we've gone through a few questions. I just want to ensure I see you there, Director Smith, and you haven't raised your hand or uh, or any other signals that you want to weigh in. I just want to encourage you to please do so if you do have anything to add to any of the questions that are that are being posed by uh, the residents. You do, please, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, in reference to Tammy Edwards' uh, question. Uh, the participants at the meeting in April of 2019 were um, two in a household. And I think that definitely this is a question that we should look at with a broader uh, inclusion of the community for the infrastructure upgrades and uh, using a few of some of the money uh, from that that has is collected or we may be looking at having another conversation in regards to the distribution upgrades um, maybe the phased approach isn't working the best for us as a community and i think this is something that we might be exploring uh, in the future but right now we're we're working towards the filtration system i do have some looked at some other funds that uh, we possibly have available for uh, the loan to bring down the loan. Uh, some community works funds at this time have been allocated in the event that we do have a loan. And also uh, we have um, uh, some other possibilities. Unfortunately, we'll have to just keep watching the, the money as it moves through the taxation and we'll move along with what is available when it comes time for moving through the construction phase and uh, ending up with the least amount of loan that we can go with in the end. Thank you. Thanks, Director Smith. Uh, our next question comes from Diana Holland, and it is, how many parcels are used for the costs uh, that you shared, Brian, of uh, $270 and $170 um, per parcel? She has some, she has some math. I can't, is it a one point? Anyways, I won't, I won't try to decipher what that was, but um, could you, if you could provide an answer to that, that'd be great. Uh, 
Sure. There's about 860 uh, parcels that we serve in the Wasalter water system. Some of those are located in Ladysmith, but they'll have to pay an equivalency as well. Okay, so Diana, your math was, was not far off uh, that you had posted there. Uh, another question from, from Sue Miller. Uh, what are the estimates for growth over the next 20 to 30 years, i.e. the life of the loan? And is the system uh, capable, are the system capabilities some multiples of the expected load? In other words, is the, will the system be sized for growth? I believe that is uh, that is what she. Yeah. Okay. So one of our one of our challenges. So it's the first. The simple answer is to a certain degree, yes, of course. But um, the other um, issue that we have in the longer term for for uh, salt air uh, on its source from Stocking Lake is that Stocking Lake's not got a lot more capacity as it's currently arranged. So. Um, what happens every year is that starting in spring, well, we draw, of course, water year round. Um, and naturally enough, in the summertime, we draw more because uh, because of the irrigation. And, you know, roughly in springtime, we start to, the, the lake is full and we start drawing it down because the, the input of uh, surface water, of rain, of drain, um, to the uh, lake is less than the amount we're drawing off it. And of course, through the summertime, there's very little, if, if, if any at all, um, going into the lake, whereas um, a lot is being drawn off it. So the water table in the, in the lake drops and drops. And then uh, when the rains start about this time of year, uh, then you know at a certain point it starts to refill again, but we're also drawing from it continuously through winter as well, although at a lesser rate. So gradually the lake fills, and then uh, usually by springtime, well, every year so far, by springtime, um, it fills again, uh, you know, where we started from and it's, and it's full and overflowing a bit um, and off we go for another year. Now, uh, in some years, and of course, the, the overall demand through that year is highly variable depending on what the summer's like. Um, and the amount of precipitation we get in is variable as well. So those, those you know, are not the same every year. But certainly, as it is now, in some years, we just barely fill and start overflowing before demand starts to bring it down again. Um, so there's not a lot extra. Also, we share Stocking Lake with Ladysmith, um, and so Ladysmith has demands as well um, that they have to meet uh, on for their water supply from the from Stocking. And so between the two, um, you know, in some years we just marginally um, fill the lake. So that's a consideration. Maybe through the dam work, it's, there's a possibility of raising the dam. That's a, that's a complex matter. Hard to say how that's going to turn out. Uh, in the meantime, we're, that's that's the water with surface water we have. So one of the other side benefits of uh, doing the uh, seeking uh, groundwater is that there's possibility that groundwater might provide more water for us in the longer term when we need it in future. Because if Stocking Lake is not able to provide that, um, then then we'll have to find another source, and there really isn't another surface water source that's that would be available to us. Um, so uh, the groundwater may be part of that answer as well. So it's uh, it's kind of looking at both and trying to come up with the best uh, approach. We can also um, in design you can you can include in the design the option for phasing further phases in the future, adding to the treatment works in a reasonable way. Um, so, for example, if you if you put in uh, two units of two trains of treatment uh, in the initial uh, construction, then you could maybe add a third um, of about the same size so the system all works together and that gives you 50% more capacity. So rather than putting in a lot of excess capacity that we'd have to pay for now um, and not really use, it's better to uh, allow for that in future in your design. That answer was much longer than I anticipated, but I think it was quite fulsome. Uh, the last question that we, sorry, Todd, did you want to add to that? Oh uh, yeah, just one one more further thing is as far as uh, on the comment of growth. Uh, one thing that Salter does lack for growth is a sanitary sewer system. So as far as subdividing and, and lands that would be subdividable, um, it's not really a concern of us uh, over the over the. Over the long the, the life of the plant, because it just it, the amount of money that would cost to even get that in order to make to have the growth is it's it's not really all that feasible. Thanks, Todd. Uh, the last question that we have posed in our Q and A um, comes from Diana Holland again, and it's what is the financing cost for this capital project over twenty years? 
Uh, I don't have that on the top of my head, but I would I know that the interest rate uh, that the province is charging now is very low. Um, boy, I uh, pardon me. It's around two percent. It might even be less than two percent. Um, it's around there, though. It's around a two percent interest rate. So that uh, so the proportion of the cost that's interest is um, modest these days as compared to the past for sure. Um, so, but if uh, I could, we could get a hold of that num that exact number, if that's uh, desirable. Director Smith, if you'd like to comment, please do. Yes, uh, I uh, spoke with finance this morning to sort of go over uh, some of these additional costs. And one of the things with the financing is, is that um, the, the loans are uh, maybe for 20 years, but the interest rate is for the 10 year period after that, it becomes a five year period. So it's an, not a, an exact number that can be given to the community based on the, the loans change after 10 years to a different uh, rate. And at 10 years, you look at another five years and after that, another five years. So it's not a number that can be exact at this time. Thank you. Thanks, Director Smith. Uh, I see that we have a couple more questions that have come in since I put the call out again for questions. Uh, this one comes from Tony Pace and is, is there anything residents need to do to ensure we receive the government grant? Perhaps Brian will let you address yes. that first and well, maybe Director Smith can, can also. I would say that uh, there isn't anything, as far as I know, that your elected director has not done. Uh, she's certainly done all in her power uh, to try and encourage uh, the provincial and federal governments to <laughs> to help us out with this problem. It um, no, not really. Um, I, I'm not aware of anything that uh, individuals can do. The 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 you know to be honest, the sometimes the grants are a little bit mysterious in the way you know some of them get awarded and some that don't. Um, why we have not been successful in two we, uh, is a bit of a mystery to me because others have been, and we have exactly the same problem um, at a small water, you know, relative to other um, larger purveyors like you know municipalities and towns and whatnot, a relatively small service population, so the costs are high uh, per household, so you'd think that would be an ideal one for the grant. Um, so that part's, uh, you know, a little bit mysterious to us, but... Um, hopefully, we we again we're all hoping to be successful. The 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 process is has a technical step with the provincial government, and then it goes to the federal government for a I don't know. They sort of say a, a, a broader perspective, whatever that means. <laughs> anyway, they uh, so between the provincial and federal governments, they decide on these grants. Uh, we've talked to the to the people at the province and try to encourage them to consider our our grant, but whether there's anything, I don't, I don't think there's anything the public can do um, to help that along. If there was, I would be sure to let them know. Please, please go ahead, Director Smith. Thank you, Chris. I, um, if there was more I could do, boy, I'd be out there doing it. I am constantly, um, I started, um, I was elected in 2018. I worked towards the, the grant that was uh, available and we did have an application in for. Unfortunately, it was oversubscribed and we were unsuccessful. After we were unsuccessful, I did spend time uh, meeting with the provincial government staff to go over, uh, was there something that we could do to uh, improve our, our application for the next uh, um, intake as the next intake was being announced at that time by the Honourable Minister of Municipal Housing and Municipal Affairs. So we, I met with them, went over it, got some pointers, passed it on to the staff. They're the experts, they're the professionals, and they were able to look at that a little hot and when it came to our next application, there was some changes that were made that reflected that. I have met with our Emma, our 
MLA, uh, Doug Broatley, I've spoken to him, met with him in his office. I've asked for letters of support for the current uh, grant application that we have in. I've also met with our MP, Paul Manley, on a few occasions, and uh, he has been very supportive and has also written a letter for our grant application. Uh, Island Health has also written a grant, uh, a letter for in support of our grant application. Um, Recently, through the summer, I've met with uh, Island Health along with staff and the CVRD board chair to work through uh, looking at our time uh, as uh, originally after we got our contravention order in January, it became clear that the staff sent in a time proposal for the installation and for the filtration and we would not be able to meet it once COVID arrived and uh, it was an opportunity for us to connect with Island Health and have them have a relook at our time frame and they've been very generous in giving us additional time and we really appreciate it. It was an opportunity for the staff to bring forward um, the the time frame, but also have time to make sure that we're not rushing this program by also including the community in the consultation and the in public engagement period, which has been greatly appreciated. Uh, as for the grants, uh, the grant is applied to, it's a provincial and federal mixed together, both portions, pay, both pay a portion into the grant uh, and the taxpayers. Now the grant application that has gone in is for 6.02 million. That includes a power generation as it was a requirement of the grant application to have an energy or a climate uh, benefit, uh, environmental benefit, and uh, possibly Mr. Dennison can speak to that. So that would bring our application to a higher cost than the 3.7. So if we receive the grant uh, on the 6 million, the portion that the community will be looking at is approximately 1.6 million for a loan for that portion. And if there's anything that might work uh, to encourage the government to um, we're waiting for the election for the provincial now. Uh, I have met with uh, with the minister prior to election being called, uh, Selena Robinson, for um, the municipal affairs and housing to indicate that this is a financial burden for the Saltair taxpayers, that our demographics are 66% are older than 55 years old. And we do have financial uh, obligations that we've taken on as for the distribution system and we need to continue with uh, working to provide safe drinking water for our community. So I think that if there's anything more to do with the grant or that would be something that maybe Mr. Dennison or Todd could uh, pass on. Thank you. Um, Brian or Todd, did you want to add anything before we go to the next question, or are we? Uh, not, not just a brief, very brief comment. Um, uh, Director Smith is sort of uh, discussing that the the uh, so the grant applications have you know some other features to them uh, that you 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 know sort of follow. So you end up with often end up with different pricing for direct community payment versus the grant program. For the grants, for example, um, we're aware that they. That they really want to see, you know, energy recovery for, as as part of your or something of that nature, um, to add some. We might use the term sizzle to your grant application to attract their attention to it. So that's something we've got in there, and a few other elements that uh, that you approach when you're doing a grant application versus, uh, you know, a more direct project where you don't have to consider those things so much. So anyway, there is a little bit of a different pricing there, but um, but that's the reason for it is because it's for the grant. Thanks, Brian. Uh, the next question uh, is from Sue Miller, and it is any estimate on when the presentation will be available on the website? Uh, I guess that's a question for myself. Uh, we'll commit to having it uh, available on the Saltair Water System page on our website before noon tomorrow, um, hopefully sooner, but uh, I would say that would be the drop dead uh, deadline for when we'll have it posted. Uh, I believe this is the final question that we have, and this is from Diana. 
Uh, is there a more detailed breakdown of the annual maintenance costs? Will this work primarily be performed by CVRD staff or subcontracted? Uh, thanks for that question. So the uh, first immediate answer is no CVRD staff. Um, all of our CVRD services, uh, sewer and water services, um, are maintained and operated by CVRD staff. Um, and so that's that's a requirement. Um, you need to have, you can't just have anybody, you know, operate these systems. They have to be qualified. You have to, there's a whole uh, system of registration for uh, sewer and water utility operators, and they need the necessary requirements and certifications in order to do that. And you really need to have your own staff looking after it. Um, you know, so they're, they're able to communicate with everybody else as issues come up. A lot of times there's some very complicated problems or uh, issues that come up and you really need to have one whole team um, looking after that. So that's the way we, we look at it. Uh, for the uh, for the figure of 150,000, that's, um, so it's not precise yet. We've allowed for um, membrane replacement in there and some estimates of time for, re for operator attention. Um, one of the things that we'll get out of the pilots that we're running uh, in the coming months is a better idea, uh, re refinement of those costs. So that's something that we'll be, you know, be able to get some more information on. We don't need approval of the public for um, the costs that come through the operation and maintenance side because it's not a borrowing. So, um, you know, we're, we've provided our estimate this time. We believe that it's conservative, um, but we'll get more information on that as we operate these pilots and we can provide an update uh, later on if it looks like we can uh, change that number. Thanks, Brian. Um, well, with that, I think that concludes the uh, the Q and A portion here. Uh, unless I see one come in in the next uh, thirty to forty five seconds, but I just want to take an opportunity to thank we we kept most of our twenty. We had I think believe we had twenty four participants, and we still have twenty two, just down from twenty three. So uh, everybody stuck with us for the full hour for the most part. I I just want to say thank you to all the Saltair residents that participated in uh, this first virtual town hall. Uh, I hope that most of the uh, the questions that were that were lingering out there in the community have been addressed by uh, our staff and elected official here. Uh, as as was said at the outset, this presentation will be posted to the CVRD website um, tomorrow and available for any other residents who are unable to participate in this. We'll also have uh, at least one in person. Um, town hall style meeting uh, opportunity for residents to participate in um, early next month. Brian, can you confirm that uh, that date for us right now? Sorry, sorry, Brian, you're still muted. I don't know if I'll ever get used to that. Uh, October 28th. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, so that is next. Uh, that is next week, Wednesday. Next week, okay, Wednesday. That's so correct. Not until yep. the end of the month. Wonderful. Um, so again, thank you to all the residents for uh, for participating in this. Thank you to our staff and Director Smith. Um, I will I will leave the final words here for uh, for the area director. Just, uh, I see a couple more questions, so I wasn't sure if you wanted to address those before I. Uh, make any comments? Oh, did I miss some? I uh, I am not seeing. There's was from, one from Tony Pace. Uh, was that to do with the government grant? Yeah. All right. oh. He says on grant, thank you for the thorough response of all efforts. I don't know why I'm not seeing that question. Uh... In my feed here. I do see one from Debbie Neal um, that just posted to say my questions did not get answered, but I'm not sure if maybe they uh, were posted in the chat and not in the Q&A. Um, can anybody, uh, is anybody able to help me out looking through to see if, uh, if they can see those questions that I'm, that I've somehow missed? And apologies, Debbie, if uh, if we did indeed. I just looking through the questions, I don't see any question from uh, Debbie Neal there. 
Uh, no, just I'm not, uh, is I'm not else? seeing any as well. Um, you know what perhaps I can do here, because I have the power, I believe, is um, let me... I, it, she's just a minute. I'm going to do something creative. No. I... Debbie, I'm... I'm not sure if you have a microphone available on oh, your no. computer, but maybe I'll uh, I'll allow you to pose the question. Um, option to ask Brian D. Debbie, I've just unmuted your microphone. If you do indeed have one, are are you able to? Do you have one? Hello. Oh, hi, Debbie. I, I, I can hear you. I believe everybody can hear you. Do you want to pose your question verbally since Perfect. we're not seeing it in the Q&A? Actually, I had a few, but um, one of them is about the reserves that each year or I don't know whether it's on a yearly basis, but reserves get saved. All tax dollars, I presume, don't get um, uh, or all monies don't from the budget from the wall water budget do not get spent each year fully so i'm wondering about what reserves there are and um how they can be applied uh thank you oh can you hear me so, yeah it's working okay um so we have in the salter budget um once we had approval a number of years ago for the pipe replacement um, we've, we put $300,000 towards that and we've spent it um, on average every year, some, some years a little under and some years a little over in order to make up the pace, but the pace has been kept all the way along until Island Health said they wouldn't give approval. So we've set that money aside. That's explicitly the money um, that's been earmarked for the pipe replacement. Um, so there's some of that set aside. Otherwise, the you might say the root budget or the rest of the budget uh, for Saltaire has not seen uh, much in the way of surplus. Um, in fact, it's getting quite lean right now. There's there's uh, very little extra money. So there, so what we you know we generally do because we're doing upgrades. Normally, you set aside surplus in a budget so that you've got money to do capital works in future. We're doing those capital works now. We're we're um, replacing pipe, or until Island Health said we had to wait, um, and we're you know uh, looking to this uh, filtration, and we also have to. Uh, deal with the dam as I mentioned as well before. So we don't have uh, much in the way of reserves right now that would be left to apply um, and significantly change the the figures for uh, for this um, filtration project. Thank you, uh, by the way, sorry, just I will say uh, anybody can always look at the salt air budget too. It's available online. You can go and look at you know where money has been spent in the past. It's all <clears throat> listed in detail there. So it's available to people. Thanks, Brian. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, I believe Debbie said that she had another question. So I'm going to, again, allow her to pose that verbally. Yeah. Debbie, if you, if you would, please. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just to, going back to grants, um, a recent email that I sent you and Lynn, um, you were, um, you said that um, the utilities had um, received about 12 million in grants since 2006. And just looking at that, um, that's like 15 years or whatever it is. Um, looking at it, Lady Smith was awarded a couple years ago a single grant for 8.5 million. And so I'm just wondering how we can increase grant applications and therefore success because uh, 12 million seems like a lot of money, but spread over the CBRD um, since 2006. And if Lady Smith can get one for their water filtration for 8.5 plus in one fell swoop, I'm wondering why we're not in the same, like at least like being more successful and what we can do to do things different. 
Right. Okay. Well, we did get one for six million for Mill Bay. It doesn't help Solterre at all, but um, you know that's also uh, quite significant. It the grant pro we we you know pursue them as aggressively as we can. Um, you know, we never let a grant program go by that. And, and remember too, that it's the whole CVRD. So this is, this is just sewer and water, but there's also grants being obtained in, you know, parks and rec and, and other areas of the CVRD as well. Right. So, um, it's a whole organization and I don't know what the total would be of all the grants that have been received uh, by the CVRD, but it'd be a much larger figure than that. Um, the, so, you know, there's various programs we try to tune our applications as best we can to those programs. For example, um, in, in, in past years, they required you to show how there would be economic development out of your grant application, you know, what, what your project was supposed to generate economic development. Uh, and then recently, they don't want to see that at all. They, they say they won't fund economic development. So <laughs> what, what, what's, uh, you know, a required item in one round of grants is exactly the opposite in another round of grants. Um, so they're complicated. We, we, I think we've, you know, when I say that we've done well, I believe that's, those are pretty good numbers for a rural regional district. Um, you can see much larger numbers for, uh, City of Vancouver or CRD, Capital Regional District, or other large communities. Um, for a rural area, I think we've done quite well. We pursue them as aggressively as we can. We try and use all the resources as best we have them available um, to us uh, to try and get those grants. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll see that uh, figure go up by another few million dollars when we get the Saltaire grant uh, in a little while. That's certainly what we're hoping. Um, you know, it's, it's the other factor is is political, to be honest, in grants and which grants you get. Um, so that's that's a difficult one. Now, when I say that, I don't mean I mean certain your area director. Um, and Smith has put a lot of effort into, she's, <laughs> she indicated, and I've indicated earlier, she hasn't left any door unknocked on in order to try and raise profile for the, the project here. Um, but to be honest, there can be limits that a, you know, uh, a single local politician as far as influence will have, whereas a larger municipality or a city or town that's kind of on the map. Um, so um, say Tofino got a very large grant um, I happen to notice a certain uh, recall that a certain prime minister likes to visit Tofino, um, you know, in the summertime. And so perhaps that raises the profile for Tofino. I'm not sure, but um, and elements of that creep into it that are very hard for us to compete with. Uh, we certainly do the best we can. Um, and, you know, we're very attentive to the grant programs and try and put together uh, an attractive package that we hope will we'll get some money for our community. Thanks, Brian. We do have that wine region designation now, so maybe that should help. Uh, Director Smith, please. Thank you. I would like to thank the staff for, uh, we have had three grant applications in for our filtration system. Uh, the amount of time and effort put into uh, creating the grant applications is a long drawn out process and it is amazing that uh, we've had three applications in and uh, we are definitely hoping that three is the right number and uh, this year uh, the grant application also has a water contravention order that brings our more attention to our our water system need for the filtration and as much as i'm disappointed that we have the water contravention order i believe that it will um, move our application to a higher level within the grant process as they're looking through it. As a community, um, when we, when I say when we receive this grant, I think we are going to have the biggest party because it is going to be uh, such a good feeling to actually be able to say we got a grant and how hard we've worked to get that grant and how many times we've already applied for that grant. So the staff are working very hard to continue to keep us in the highlight. Um, as uh, the staff have indicated, there's um, utilities, approximately 39 utilities between wastewater and the water system. 
apps that are out there and um, grant applications have to be spread around and we've been very fortunate that we're at the top of the list right now and uh, they're continuing to move that along. I continue to move it along almost daily, uh, reaching out to uh, MLAs, MPs, uh, anyone that I can to uh, encourage them to move our application to the top of the line. So I'd like to thank staff and I'd like to thank all the Saltair residents that have attended today. This has definitely been a interesting development for how our communities are, re are rising to the occasion to be able to communicate. And I appreciate Chris for hosting the event today and uh, Brian Dennison and Todd and Louise and Ingrid, and I know Lisa's hiding there someplace over at the shoulder of Brian, uh, making sure he gets unmuted and muted. But I'd like to thank everyone for uh, making today a special day for all of us and hope that there are questions. If you have more questions, as Brian has said, he'd be glad to receive them and uh, work on them. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming today to uh, work. And I know you've all seen me out at the mailboxes putting up my posters, um, but I believe that uh, that's a great way to also communicate with the community. Community. So thank you for your time today. Thanks, Director Smith. Uh, we did have a question that was posed by Chris Bomford that apparently didn't come through earlier in our Q&A. Um, and it is, who is allowed to write in a protest or I suppose opposition to the project in an AAP process? Uh, the property owners or all members of a household? Um, I think I'll preface the response by saying that we we're not in an AAP process at this point and that would be a decision of our board um, to use that mechanism for this but uh, Brian maybe you could if, if you're knowledgeable about it could elaborate in terms yes. of who's eligible sure so it's any of the voters within um, the service area so it's not property owners if it's an AAP process if that's one we're talking about then it's the voters within um, within that service area so if, if, for example, if you had people renting a, um, a home in, in there, they could, they, they could, so there'd be voters and they would certainly be able to fill out a form. Or if a family had, say, a young adult um, family member, a child or, you know, of theirs that uh, was 18 or so and could now uh, vote, then they would be able to as well, if they so chose. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying that, Brian. Uh, well, with that, oh, all right, a lot, the lot. We'll cap it at the last question here, and it just came in from Debbie. Are there ways to partner with our First Nations as Lady Smith has done successfully, um, i.e. Penelicate? So um, partnering with First Nations, I think, in general, is a great idea if you can make it work. Um, in this case, the, you know, the, the um, the Penelicut aren't, you know, it's not a, it's not an easy matter. It would be a very expensive matter to try and extend servicing, you know, all that distance uh, in order to tie them in in some way or other. Um, so in this particular circumstance, there doesn't seem to be, um, you know, an opportunity to do that. If there was another opportunity in future, that would be, you know, certainly something we could we could look at. Um, but um, but it's it's a good idea. All right, great. Well, with that, um, we will conclude this uh, this virtual town hall meeting. Uh, thank you again to all the participants. Thank you again to our staff and our area director for participating. Uh, again, the video will be posted uh, to the website tomorrow. Uh, we will, our utility staff can follow up with an email reply to all the participants here today with a direct link to that. So any residents who did participate, if you want to share that link with your neighbors and friends um, so they can become informed on this matter, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, and, uh, and also uh, some information will also be distributed about the October 28th meeting so that everybody um, is aware of it. So again, thank you everybody for participating. Uh, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing some of you in the very near future.